the Richthofen family. Richthofen comes from a noble family or well, minor nobility. Uh, so that they're, they're there, they come from Silesia, which later became part of Poland. Um, there's the family coat of arms, and uh, they part. Some of the members of the family are involved in the judicial system. Uh, so um, you can see on the on the um, uh, on the coat of arms there the judge there. So a Richter in German uh, is a judge. So I think that's part of where the family name comes from. Um, and if we look at uh, Richthofen's background, Manfred's background, so of course the borders were different in those days. Germany, or the modern Germany, became Germany in 1871, um, that was part of, of what's now Poland. So he was, he was born in Lower Silesia, a little place, Kleinberg. It's now part of Rocklau, I uh, hope that's pronounced correctly, prominent Prussian aristocratic family. So he's a von Richthofen, he's from nobility. His dad is, uh, is in the army, Major Albrecht, uh, and his mother was Kuning, Kunigunde von Schickfussen Neudorf, again, noble family. He had two oldest, he had an elder sister, Ilse, and two younger brothers. Um, the war kicks off 1914, as we know, and Richthofen Manfred wants to be involved in the fighting. And he wants to, he wants to be involved, he wants to know uh, if he can, um, he, he, he wants to play an interesting part. He wants to join in the excitement. He wants to be a cavalry officer. And so he's a, a lancer. This is Ulan cavalry. You can see this rather smart uniform. The, the chaps get distinctive of the, the, the lancer units. And um, he's, he serves in the cavalry on both the Eastern Front and the Western Front. There's a bit more mounted activity on the Eastern Front, uh, certainly after 1914. Uh, so he was in Russia, he was in France, he was in Belgium. But he, get, he kind of gets sidelined, he gets into some logistics work. He's, be, he's involved in sorting out supplies. Now supplies are very important, but he wanted to be at the front line, he wanted to be killing the enemy. Um, and uh, so he gets a bit stuck as uh, looking after the transport systems. And he's on record as saying, I have not gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs. I've gone to war for another purpose. That's, that's part of his application for transfer. So he gets to join the flying service. Now, this is new. Flying is a very new thing. Um, so June to August 1915, he's an observer on reconnaissance missions over the Eastern Front. August 1915 goes to Belgium. He transfers to a flying unit in Ostend. Uh, now, it is it is believed that as as an observer, i.e., um, the the observer, the rear gunner uh, behind the pilot, he, it's it's believed that he actually shot someone down um, over the French lines. It was a French farm, and that's the French farm and aeroplane there in the bottom right. However. The aeroplane fell over Allied lines. Germans couldn't confirm the kill, so he didn't get that. Uh, that, that wasn't recorded in his favour. Uh, as you may know, he ends up with uh, a score of 80 kills. So July 1909, Roe did his Type 1 triplane. You can see it there, top left. Uh, if I did, there go, there's a red marker. And that flew all of 300 feet. This is 1909, he gets 300 feet. March 1910, he's got another version of a triplane. April 1912, he's trying a monoplane. Uh, we've had one like this in the Museum of Manchester. And then 1912, he's on a Type G. So each, each progressive type is looking more like the standard aeroplane that we see in World War I. But by the time World War I starts off, we've got some, um, we've got some basic aeroplanes. Uh, and uh, this is an early pusher type. What do we mean by a pusher? We mean that the propeller is behind, so the propeller is pushing it along rather than uh, rather the propeller being at the front pulling it along. That means you can put a machine gun at the front and you're not going to shoot off your propeller, which was the big problem for World War I. Uh, 
this particular type of aeroplane, it looks rather primitive, doesn't it? Um, that's operated by the British from July 1914 all the way through to 1916, when we start getting some, some aeroplanes together that look a bit more substantial things like the Camel and the SE-5. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, aeroplane technology has developed enormously. Um, and uh, you know, they say you shouldn't have favourites, but I have a favourite World War I aeroplane. And for me, it's the Fokker D7, uh, which I think is a beautiful looking aeroplane. When I was a war gamer at secondary school, this is the aeroplane that I wanted to fly. Um, and I think that's a beautiful aeroplane. But you know, just, just look at how, how attractive that is, how substantial it is. It, it's not quite as gorgeous as the Spitfire yet, but it's on the way. And then pioneers in aerial warfare. I won't spend any great length of time on this slide, but you could see here from 1914 through to 1915, various firsts, the first dogfight of the war in 1914, um, the first use of machine guns to shoot another airplane out in the sky itself. It's all very, very new. So here we have a classic German airplane. This is the Fokker Eindecker, which means Fokker one deck or Fokker one winged monoplane. And there was a period known as the Fokker Scourge when the Germans had these good aeroplanes up in the sky in 1915 into 1916. Alongside Richthofen, there's a guy called Burmer, who was uh, a colleague of Richthofen. And these two guys get, got signed up together by Bölke. So they, they met, uh, they had a chance meeting, I think it was on a, a, a train, and they were talking. And Bölke could see that Richthofen and, and Burma would, would make really good pilots. So he took them, took them on and brought them into his, his flying unit. Uh, Manfred himself managed to pull his brother Luther uh, from uh, a job in training and got him involved in flying as well. So uh, in uh, 1916, uh, Manfred joins number two bomber squadron and flies a two-seater albatross. So here we have this is a two-seater albatross. It's a bomber, so it's slightly bigger than a, than a fighter plane. Uh, and at this stage, he's a below average pilot. Oh, I thought he was the best pilot in all of World War I. Well, it, well, he was arguably, but he had, took, it, took a while learning. Arguably, um, Rick Tofen's first kill as a combat pilot was that he shot down a Newport over Verdun, actually over Fort Douaumont. However, he didn't get the credit for shooting him down. It wasn't very well recorded. So although he scores 80 kills by the end of the war, well, but by the time he's killed, he doesn't get a credit for this one. So... What is his first aeroplane? And he's not yet flying red aeroplanes. It takes a while before he gets the red paint, paint pot out. Um, so his first plane as a pilot, first fighter plane, is the Albatross D2. There you can see it. Looks a bit like a kind of fish, really, isn't that shape? Well, yeah, it's rather attractive. Um, and so August 1916, Rick Tofen is flying these aeroplanes. Uh, Armed with two big hefty machine guns, two Spandaus, 500 rounds per barrel. Germ the Germans had pairs of machine guns. They were doing a fair bit of damage when they hit. A lot of the Allied pilots were only firing single machine guns at this stage. So if they did get a hit, it wasn't doing quite so much damage. Of course, the whole trick is to fly up behind the other guy. And this is how Rick Token gets a lot of his kills. So his very first confirmed kill, 17th of September, 1916, he's flying the Albatross D2 and he knocks down one of these FE2Bs. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, it's my first confirmed kill. I honored the falling enemy by placing a stone on his beautiful grave. Odd way of thinking about things. And he goes to a jeweler in Berlin and orders a silver cup. He wants to commemorate each of his kills with a silver cup. And he ended up with 60 of them. And after he got 60, they ran out of silver in Berlin. And he wasn't prepared to accept cups made out of a, a less valuable metal. 
So he only got 60 of them, although he gets another 20 kills. FE2B stands for Farmal, Farman Experimental Type 2. And there's, there's another photograph of an FE2B. Back to Oswald Bulker. So if you remember, he literally wrote the book. He wrote, this is how you do combat flying. Uh, and uh, they were involved in a, in a, a dog fight in October 1916. Um, and Rick Hofen was involved in this, this dog fight as well. He was, he was in that unit. Um, unfortunately, Burma's aircraft catches Bulka's aircraft and damages the wing. And tragically, with the damaged wing, the aircraft uh, plummets towards the ground. He can't recover it, uh, and he's uh, Bulka is killed. So, so they're now short of a leader for um, the, for the German hunting squadrons. Now, one of Richthofen's most famous victims, 23rd of November 1916, is up against this gentleman, Major Lano. Hawker, who actually has the Victoria Cross. Didn't they have brilliant names in World War I? Um, now, Hawker has been a great pilot. Uh, again, he has a fairly fundamental basic aeroplane, the, the, the DH-2. You can see the photograph there. And um, they are engaged in a dogfight. They're very closely matched. The two aeroplanes, there's very little between them. Uh, so they're circling one another, trying to take a pot shot at one another. Unfortunately, Hawker is running low on fuel. He has to go, he has to head back home, head back to the aircraft, to the airfield. At this point, Richthofen is able to get behind him, shot him down. So that's the 11th kill. Now, January 1917, that he had damage to his aeroplane, so he, he uses a Halberstadt D2 for a short while. And while he's using this aircraft, Richthofen is fighting with some FE-8, so that's a photograph on the top right there. Just, there we go, that one there. That's an FE-8. And Richthofen's aeroplane is shot through the fuel tank, so um, it, the fuel's running out. Richthofen's got to crash land fairly early uh, in order to, to survive and fly another day. And so Richthofen is shot out of the sky on this occasion, January 1917. Uh, so no, March uh, is when he's shot down by Edwin Bembo. That's Edwin Bembo on the right there. So uh, arguably, Richthofen only actually gets shot down three times. Richthofen was very keen to get the highest award possible, which is known as its popular name was the Blue Max. It's known as the Paul Le Marais for merit, which is the um, the wording on the medal. So our highest medal is the, is the Victoria Cross. For the Germans, it was the um, the Paul and Marais. In order to get that medal, you had to you had to shoot down sixteen enemies. Any plane, you had to have it properly recorded. So so you didn't just have to shoot down sixteen. They had to be observed <coughs> and confirmed. Um, this is his trophy room back home at his mum's house. Whenever he shot down an aeroplane, if he was shot down over German lines, and of course the British needed to be on the offensive, so they were generally flying over the German lines, so a lot of the aeroplanes fell down in British lines, he would then commandeer a, a car to go to visit the wreckage. Maybe even the, the, the pilots, the, the observers had survived, so he would meet them. And he was very keen to get souvenirs. So you see all the serial numbers here from the aeroplanes. Uh, you can see his photo in the middle there. Uh, and if you look at the top at the, uh, he's even got a, a, uh, an engine there, a rotary engine uh, for, uh, for his, his oh, said candelabra. Early 1917 was a good time for the German air service. Uh, He's now moved on to another aeroplane, the Albatross <coughs> D3. And this is the first aeroplane that he paints red. Um, and so he's got a reputation. People have seen that he's flying over the, the Western Front and he's painted his, painted his aeroplane red. So he's very distinctive. People will know he's the red flyer 
or he writes a book, Die Rote Kampfflieger, the Red Battle Flyer. And why has he done it? He wants to be recognised. We're not talking about camouflage in these days. He wants everyone to know it's him. And the other guys in his squadron paint their aeroplanes mostly red, but distinct. His is all red, the others are red and a bit of, so you can tell them apart. Um, Albatross D3, great aeroplane for its time. Uh, and uh, this is the aeroplane that's dominating the skies in 1917. It's known, known as Bloody April, um, various reasons for that. The simple version is the Germans had better aeroplanes in the sky and the Allies were struggling with to have aeroplanes that were as good, but the, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so here we see Richthofen's squadron. It's a pity they didn't have colour photography in those days. There's probably a colorized version of this somewhere. Richthofen himself shoots down 22 British aircraft in April 1917. One day, he actually shot down four in one day. And he, his official tally gets up to 52. And there we have a rather lovely model um, of Richthofen with the red arrow. And now it's the Albatross D5. So the Albatross company are producing new versions of their aeroplanes. And once they're confident the aeroplane is a good design, who's the first to get it? It's Richthofen. We'll give him, and that's good for publicity as well. Richthofen is really good for the German war effort. His picture is, is on the front page of lots of newspapers. Every time he shoots down another Allied aeroplane, it's big news in Germany. Haven't we got the best flyers ever? Ooh, hooray for the Reich. There we see uh, Mr. Mr. Manfred with his other pilots. His brother's one of those there. Uh, and the dog on the bottom left. So it can't be so bad if he's got a dog. Uh, and Richthofen in popular culture. Uh, now, James knows of my enthusiasm for Jethro Tull. I other, also rather like Led Zeppelin. And here's a famous photograph on the left of Richthofen in his aeroplane with his pilots. And you can see that Led Zeppelin borrowed that photograph and then manipulated it and put some different heads in. Uh, where are we? There we go. Um, for the, the cover of Led Zepp 2. So this is just Richthofen appearing in popular culture. Um, the Germans are making really good use of him um, for publicity. And uh, so he, in May 1917, he's called to have a meeting with the, the senior guys of the air service, um, Sir Hermann Thompson and Ernst von Hüttner, uh, in the Imperial headquarters at Bart Kreuznach. Uh, and this, this photograph appears in his book, which is the Red Battle Flyer, uh, which was published in 1917. So they said, we need you to have a little bit of a break from flying to write this book because people want to read about you and what you're doing. This is very important. This is, an, this is a key moment in Richthofen's life. This is where he gets a wound in the head. So July the 6th, 1917, he was about to attack a Vickers Bomber, so it's a Vickers two-seater aeroplane. He hadn't even taken the safety catch off his gun. And he's within about 300 metres of the enemy. Now, he says, Rick Tofer says, the best marksman does not, just does not hit the target at this distance. No one's going to, going to get a hit at 300 metres. It's too far away. However, there's, shall we say it's a lucky hit from the, the, the British aeroplane? Um, from the Vickers, uh, there's a blow to his head. He was totally paralysed and blinded. He's been hit in the head. We'll see where the hit was in a moment. He couldn't move his limbs. He could tell that he was going into a dive. He couldn't see. He was blinded. Uh, when, the, when the darkness slowly lifted, he checked his altimeter. And he could see that he was about 800 metres off the ground. He dropped 3,000 metres very rapidly. He managed, manages to recover enough to get down to 50 meters and he makes a rough landing. He realizes he's going to faint again. He's landed on the German side of the line, which is fortunate for him. And he just, he, he just collapses. And he remembers that, that he fell on a thistle. So people rush out and get hold of him and look after him. He's still flying an Albatross D5 at this stage. Uh, this particular machine, not an all red one. 
that's, that's not important really. You can see here the photograph of the damage in his flying helmet. He's been lucky to survive that shot. <clears throat> maybe, maybe if it was three or four millimetres close to the brain, he'd have been dead. So it scraped his head. It's, it's dead. And it certainly affected him. It changed him for the rest of his life, as you would imagine. Anyone that's had um, a nasty wound to their head, it can, kind of, it can change you. So he has to spend some time in hospital. Here he is in field hospital number 76 uh, near, in Courtrai in Belgium. Uh, there's that particular nurse. I, I call her Sister Keita. I think that's how you, you say the name. Uh, don't think there's any romance between them. Maybe there was. Don't know. Um, he's there for 20 days. He is not happy. He wants to be flying. Rather like Albert Ball. If you remember, he was very keen to be back in his aeroplane. Rick Tofen just wants to be flying. He want, That's what he loves. He wants to be out there hunting. He wants to be <laughs> shooting down the enemy. He doesn't want to be in a hospital. Might be nice to have Keita to talk to. He'd rather be up in the clouds. What about his dog? He wants to be out there with his dog. Drink beer with his dog, with his mates. Then go flying. Then kill some British pilots. That's what he wants to do. But he's determined to go flying. And they can't really stop him. Uh, they said, you shouldn't go flying until your, your wound's completely healed, but off he goes. So this is, this is July, late July 1917. He's been badly damaged, but he's gone back to flying. And he's never quite the same thereafter. Now, there's a, a medical record. There's an article in The Lancet in 1999. Uh, was the Red Baron fit to fly? I've read the entire article. And it basically says, looking back on all the evidence available to us now, the doctor said, you shouldn't fly because you're not completely fit, but he did. And maybe he wasn't ever quite as, as capable, quite as with it, quite as on the ball as he had been before. However, at least he gets the best aeroplane available. Some would say the best aeroplane in World War I. I prefer the Fokker D7, but the Fokker triplane, the DR1. Uh, this is what he flies from late July 1917. But of the 80 kills credited to Richthofen, he only, he only got 19 of them from the, the triplane. So that's almost a, almost a quarter of his kills were the triplane. Beautiful little aeroplane, quite small, very manoeuvrable. And uh, it's got the twin machine guns. Actually, you could say, looks rather like the Sopwith triplane. So maybe the Sopwith triplane preceded it. And we British people could say, ah, the Germans sold our technology, use some of our best ideas. 21st of April, 1918. He's flying over the Morancor Ridge near the Somme River. Uh, this location is actually quite easy to find if you know where to go. Um, 21st of April, he's... He's pursuing a pilot in a Sopwith Camel. Now, it's a Canadian pilot, Wilfred May, whose nickname was Wop. So he's, he's, he's flying, he's trying to shoot down Wop May, who's fairly inexperienced. Now, May had just fired on his cousin, Wolfram, Wolf, Wolfram um, and Manfred's upset about this. So he flies to rescue his cousin. And so Wilfred, May is, is flying away and he pursues May across the Somme River and he's briefly spotted and attacked by another uh, pilot, another Canadian pilot, Arthur Brown or Roy Brown, not Roy Chubby Brown, he's somewhere else. Uh, and Brown had to dive steeply at very high speed to intervene and then had to climb steeply to avoid hitting the ground. So the problem here is that Richthofen's got it's what's called target fixation. He's become preoccupied with flying against Wilfred May. And he's forgetting all the advice that he gave his pilots. He said, don't fly low. Don't fly in straight lines. Don't get fixated on just one enemy pilot. You need to keep looking out because someone will crack up behind you and so on. Now, uh, in a stop with Camel, we have Captain Roy Brown. Um, and there, there's his photograph. 
there's a photograph of the with Camel. And Roy Brown claims that he shot down Rick Tofen, but he didn't. There's a lot of controversy about this. Um, uh, it's pretty clear now that the, the bullet that killed him was fired from the ground because um, it, it came in from underneath. A single bullet penetrates from the right arm, it comes out next to the left nipple. It's come from below. Brown's attack was from above. That's not, it's not a bullet from Brown's machine gun that's killed him. It's a machine gunner from the ground. Now, um, th there's various people who, uh, who <coughs> get the claim to this, but um, my money is with Sergeant Cedric Popkin, uh, the Australian machine gunners using a Vickers gun. There's, there's other arguments, someone says Snowy Evans and so on, um, with a Lewis gun. So here's a photograph of the wreck a few days later, where you can see the rotary engines kind of mostly intact, uh, but people have grabbed strips of um, strips of the canvas, so sort of strips of red canvas. I've got a strip of red canvas. It's from the red from the Rick Tofen's um, Fokker triplane. I'm sure there's a lot of strips of red canvas, and maybe some of them were from the triplane. Um, there's the uh, machine gun company with Sergeant Cedric Popkin uh, in the photograph. Uh, and, uh, and there we have the Australians feeling very pleased with themselves. They've got a bit of souvenir. They've got the tailplane of his triplane. So he's buried with full honours. Here we see 22nd of April. He's buried in a British cemetery. <coughs> we recognise that he's an honourable fellow. We want to give him a good burial, so, so they look after him. Uh, but then after the war in the 1920s, the Germans set up a military cemetery at a place called Freecorp. Now, I hadn't realised that he'd been buried in Freecourt. I was driving through the Somme with a friend. We're driving slowly past this cemetery, and I say, stop the car, stop the car. I've just seen a photograph of Rick Tofen. So we stopped the car. I went, oh, his body was moved here after the war. Uh, so for a while, he was buried in this cemetery, <coughs> uh, and a, a lot of graves of German cemeteries actually have two bodies in them. Now, what happened here is that the family of the German government thought, actually, we should give more honour to Rick Tofen because he's, he's, a, he's a war hero. He's a great hero. So let's not have him buried in some odd field away in France on the Somme. Let's bring him to Berlin and let's bury him with honours at the Invalidenfriedhof in Berlin. So that's where he goes. His body is transferred there in 1925. Now, not surprisingly, the Nazis want to adopt him. There's an entire talk about how the Luftwaffe were short of practice, were short of heroes. Um, they, they, had, they were only allowed a small number of planes, so, so they had to make the best use they could of all the heroes from World War I, read all their books because they, they didn't have much else. And the Nazis go a bundle for Richthofen and they design a really grand tomb for him. So he's got gets a new grave, a new tomb. You can see here's a, here's a wreath on the 20th anniversary of his death with the Nazi guards and so on. The Invalidenfriedhof is just a, an awkward position in Berlin, right on where the Berlin Wall was. And so there, there was various moments where people were trying to escape from East Germany and uh, bullets were fired at them. And so there was bullet damage on Rick Tofen's grave. So it wasn't in a terribly good position. So the family ask if they can relocate Rick Tofen. So, so the body is moved again for the fourth time and it goes to Wiesbaden and his younger brother, Bodko, got permission. And so his body is moved in 1975. And there's the family grave with, with um, Manfred in the family grave. Now, here's a bit of trivia because I love a bit of trivia particularly if there's dogs involved. <coughs> um, we've, we all think of the Red Baron as Richthofen. Uh, uh, we all think of Richthofen as known as the Red Baron. But this term was, was barely used until the 1960s. Um, and there's, there's a graph, there's a couple of, a couple of rather interesting <coughs> articles all about the use of the name. What happens is he appears 
in the Snoopy in the Peanuts cartoon in the comic strip, <laughs> 1965. And thereafter, this really popularizes the name of the Red Baron in popular culture, which I think is quite intriguing, really. The, the, the modern German Luftwaffe still regards Richthofen as one of the great, their great heroes. There is actually a modern German squadron, so Jagdschwader 71, uh, uh, which was their first operational jet fighter unit. And they, they are the Richthofen squadron. They continue his name. And you can see their, their airplanes here, the Eurofighter Typhoon. If you have a look at the tailplane, there we use the red marker. You see his, his image and the, the picture of the, the triplane. So he's still remembered by the Luftwaffe. Uh, talk to my German friend who tells me that the German political right have tried to adopt Richthofen as well. That's caused a, a bit of upset. <laughs>